Thank you very much, Ben. And uh, um, I'm so happy to be here with Mary, my wife. Now, if I speak about like this, can John Lavin hear me in the back? Um, John and Mary Ellen, also, thank you. Um, you must find a way to get uh, John Lavin uh, telling uh, his particular form of harmless but hysterically funny non-vulgar ethnic joke sometimes about <laughs> Irish clergymen. And um, uh, that is how I first came to really love John Lavin, was his jokes, um, beyond all the other things that I later learned were uh, so much a part of him. And I thought I'd just uh, talk for uh, two weeks about, um, <clears throat> I'll keep to time, we'll, uh, maybe I'll talk about 25 minutes or something like that, and then we'll, uh, we finish promptly at two, or before, but there'll be some Q&A if that seems right. I'd like to talk on the question, what happens to you when you die? And um, it's a, uh, a question of, um, I mean, I guess I think it's the most important question uh, that there is. And um, I'm going to talk about what happens when you die today, and then I'm going to give you some homework, uh, just inner emotional homework for this week, and then I'll come back to it in light of your homework, and you, no one will be called upon um, the following uh, week, next uh, week. One of the things that uh, people say, and by the way, if you don't uh, know me, um, I'll, I'll just sort of go right into it. Um, when you hear a speaker that you don't know particularly or you've never heard them speak, the first 10 minutes of what they say is completely wasted time. <laughs> so nothing that I say for the first 10 minutes, I'm just going to circle for a landing. Uh, for about 10 minutes and dither around uh, because nothing that I say will have any impact whatsoever on anyone here for at least 10 minutes because people need a kind of emotional time to kind of cue in to whatever this person is talking about, to get used to his or her voice uh, and just to sort of silence all the numerous other voices that we all have. I mean, there's no telling what you're thinking about really right now. There's absolutely no telling. And if, in fact, if there were telling, 40% of you would leave the room in total shame. <laughs> because, in fact, some of the things you're thinking about right now are appalling. Um, from any point of view, that's men and women, all of us. So this is why the first 10 minutes are inconsequential. And I might as well stand up here and read from the Astoria phone directory. <laughs> so um, let me just say, to begin with, that um, often uh, people will say that it's not the um, arrival or destination that matters, it's the journey. Have you ever heard that? It's not the destination that matters, it's the journey. Now, that is the kind of popular wisdom that is highly confused and deeply not true to experience, although it sounds good. I mean, doesn't it sound good to say it doesn't matter where you go, because we all are trying to come to the top of Mount Fuji, but it's the way you get there that matters. And I personally reject that reasoning, although I understand what is meant by that. Of course I do, and you do. But it really doesn't matter at the point of dissolution, that is to say at the point of physical death, what your journey has been um, at that moment uh, consisting in, and everybody's is different. What really matters at the point of dissolution is where am I going? Because life, physical life, is actually very short. It's a journey of four score years and whatever it is, and in light of the Andromeda galaxy and Pluto, I'm deeply interested in Pluto, um, or the seventh planet for that matter, um, uh, you will find um, that the, um, uh, at the moment of dissolution, it will be far more of concern to you where the next destination is than where you've been. As a matter of fact, at the end, 
if you're not too heavily sedated, uh, th there will just be a few things you'll remember from your journey. You'll probably remember one person at the end of your life. One person other than yourself. Possibly two. When it actually comes down to being at Lenox Hill or St. Vincent's used to be whatever it is. And so I'm a, a great believer. I now, when I do a, a funeral, and I've done some recently, I always like to, you know, Episcopal clergymen are uh, Clergy don't believe in eulogies. It's, you can't resist it today because there's such a desire to have them. But the tradition was that there was never a eulogy in an Episcopal service. Never. Until about 1995. Now it's one huge sentimental eulogy. 100% uh, in denial of the reality of the person. But you, um, <laughs> you, you, uh, you what I found... Um, what, what I want to say now when I give a uh, sermon at a funeral, of course I want to talk about the person a little bit and to try to uh, offer thanks for the many different uh, problems, issues, and gifts that the person brought to my life. But the biggest question, let's say you're bearing someone like Bob, is where is Bob? And that's the question that the sort of larger world has absolutely nothing to say concerning. Because Bob is like a will-o'-the-wisp. He's gone. People will constantly say, he's gone. And I want to say, but where? And they'll say, well, how do you know? And what I say, I don't know for sure. But if you don't ask the question, you're not being true to the reality of the dying process. Because you, you, as the person who's lost the loved one, needs to know something because you love this person. She was the anchor of your entire existence, and now she's not there. So if it doesn't occur to you to ask the question, where is she, I mean, does, it's, it's the only question to ask. And the same would be of yourself. Where am I going? You all remember Gauguin's uh, famous painting in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. Where did I come from? Where am I? And where am I going? It's a whole wall of the BFA. And um, Gauguin said, of course I want to know about the person that I am. But I must include among the great questions, where am I going? Remember the song in Hair? The great song, where am I going? Hippies even ask the question, where am I going? And so the thing that I'm trying to say to you is the journey is not as important as the destination. However, whatever you believe about the destination will affect the journey. If you have no confidence that there is anything beyond the veil, that will affect the way you lead your life. It will affect the way you deal with sex. Because if there's nothing after the grave, then you've got to get all you can while you can. Why did I say that? But I've, many people have told me that, that the number one thing that they missed in their lives was they didn't get enough sex. I couldn't believe it when this older lady told me this. That was the number one thing you missed. But that she was so honest. I mean, she's in heaven for that very reason. She's the kind of person, she's the kind of person Pope Francis uh, 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 would immediately have brought in because she was so honest. Now, um, but there are other things that you think about. The, the journey will be affected by what you think lies after the journey. But the, um, if, if, uh, if you totally concentrate on the journey, you'll be very surprised when the moment comes when you're actually facing physical death. Now, there are probably some people here in this room who have actually, specifically, literally, concretely, and individually faced that moment in all kinds of different situations. So the purpose of these, uh, uh, I'm trying to get smiles out of you and I'm failing terribly, but y'all rather, y'all get my, my humor. When I first heard Jim preach here at the church, we were here for his first Sunday, and it was as if, um, it was so interesting because Jim was new to the psychodynamic vibe of the church. And um, 
I sort of said, you know, your sermon was so brilliant, but it, it didn't seem brilliant. <laughs> be, be, no, no, don't miss what I meant with, because, because he hadn't built, he hadn't built the tenor and the resonance and the connection with the people to whom he is speaking that creates the magic of a fine sermon. When I heard him preach where he used to be, you just the whole, all of, of Springfield came to be quiet. But here it'll probably be a couple months because uh, he needs to, you need to, it's a two-way relationship. It's not computer dating. Something has to actually happen. So that's why what I was saying, this first talk will be a failure. But it will, um, it will set the stage for some questions that are of urgent importance for everyone here. I go to so many Episcopal churches on Sunday mornings, and you never get the impression that what's going on is urgent. I'm talking about the normal, progressive, heavily progressive SJW parishes, which surround us. And they say laudatory things about homeless and uh, all the different issues of the day and the various problems that we have socially, which are perfectly fine, but it's very elliptical because they always seem to pole vault over the real reason people come to church. And the real reason people come to church is to get comfort. They're in despair to get love, to get some sense that life is not just a complete joke which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, that there is in fact something beyond this uh, extraordinarily pathetic theater that we live for years and years and years until suddenly we realize that it wasn't theater and oh my gosh, I'm caught with my pants down. So this is why I'm talking about these matters. I'm, I'll try to make it as light as possible. <laughs> um, but... Um, I want to talk a little bit today about um, what happens when you die, because it is, for me, I'm just one person, it may not be for you, to me it is the only question in which I'm interested. Now that doesn't mean I'm not interested in marriage, and in love, and children, and grandchildren, and work, and the church, and life in this broken world, but this question, where will I go when I die, Perhaps it's just because I'm getting a little older, you know, or maybe you've had a health crisis or something. But this can happen when you're 30. It can happen when you're 30. It can happen when you're 16. You begin to sort of see, oh, I really need to think about this. So that's what we're going to talk about. Now, today I'm going to talk about three things briefly. Um, what, what has to die in order for you to die well? What about your current life has to die in order for you to die well, whether you're 20 or 50, or whatever you are? And secondly, what is worth holding on to? What is it about your life that will endure beyond the grave? So the first question is, what about your life you will not take with you? And that, this will be a little bit deconstructing. Uh, you may not like this. I preached a sermon a little bit along these lines to the Episcopal High School of Jacksonville, uh, uh, Florida once, not realizing that all of my listeners were 16. <laughs> and it was about the worst reaction I've ever had. There was a food fight right on the spot because I had completely forgotten that there is no way that the vast majority of my hearers could not see what I was saying as incredibly downbeat. But it's actually not, but I was never asked back. <laughs> now, um, Peter Pearson. <laughs> anyway, um, we're gonna, the first question is, what, what are we going to be forced to leave behind? And how does that reflect on the journey? And the second is, what do we have now that we're going to have after we die? And then the third is going to be a slight kind of a coda on the specifically Christian dimension of the forgiveness of sins. Then next week, we're going to talk about 1 Corinthians 13, about faith, hope, and love abide, but the greatest of these is love, in light of uh, today. Now it's about 10 minutes, and I can start. See? <laughs> now, um, what, do you, what are you going to leave uh, behind uh, when you die, whatever age you are? I'm going to list a few things. You're going to have to leave behind your career. All ideas that you ever had that uh, your uh, career is uh, 
something that is valuable or important. I'm talking about your career. That is one of the things that we leave behind. Of course, Dorothy Day had a great career, right? But um, St. Francis had a great career, but he didn't think of it that way. But most of what the world, anyone here who actually thinks their career has any kind of substance, that not only will be left behind, because your career will come collapsing soon enough. How can he say that? Well, uh, or your, your, simply when you die, I mean, believe me, when you're, if, you, if you were an outstanding salesman of some very important product, you will not be thinking about that. I can honestly say 100% of the people that I have uh, buried, whom I have seen, I've seen hundreds of people close to death, and not one has ever mentioned their career, except a couple who had eleemosynary careers or highly altruistic careers and at some level found themselves doing something out of love. But for most of us, especially if we're young, we think career is important. One of the biggest problems with feminism today is that women are inheriting or believing the lie that men have believed. Men believed that career was important, and they're all dead. They all have heart attacks and strokes. They're all living down in Florida, half alive, those men. And now women seem to suddenly think that that, that ended in disaster is going to not end in disaster for them. Now, you may disagree, but um, career has to be uh, left behind completely. I had a career for 40 years uh, as an Episcopal clergyman, and um, it failed. I mean, some things succeeded. I mean, Jacob's over here. Ben apparently saw a few things. Um, but um, <laughs> if, if you want to look at... I had this idea that, for example, that the Episcopal Church, quote, as an institution, might actually be transformed as a result of my ministry. And actually, when I go to 90% of the Episcopal churches I go to, I feel I'm in the bad dream of George Bailey, and it's a wonderful life. Because <laughs> everything that I feared would happen to the Episcopal church has happened 100%. I mean, I go into these George Bailey, it's a wonderful, what was the name, Bedford Falls? I'm in Bedford Falls every time I go to an Episcopal church. Everything I was trying to bring to the Episcopal church has been uh, denied and uh, is uh, not here. I don't think you realize how, how, how unbelievably threatened, I mean, exceptional you are. Um, but, and I'm not talking about other, there are other great Episcopal churches, but in the Northeast where I live a lot of the time. So I've had to say, you know, everything I ever thought or conceived myself to be doing failed, with a couple of exceptions, of course. And therefore, what does that say? And what does that say about your career? Let's say you were a scholar and you were trying to prosecute a certain school of thought or let's say you were working in a hospital in great hopes that this hospital could become a truly wonderful institution. And the longer you stay at the hospital, the worse it is. And as soon as you left, they called the exact opposite person. And it's even 10 times worse now than when you retired. Now, of course, that's not your experience. But um, you, what you'll find is that when you die, not only empirically will you find that your career, you're almost embarrassed about it. <laughs> well, I love it. I love you. <laughs> Not only do you find you're almost embarrassed about it, but you'll find that you're, you, 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 you'll, you'll, you'll see, oh my gosh, I was so adolescent, but I was 60, you know. So, so your career, uh, generally speaking, with a few exceptions, um, will, is something that, that you, 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 you have to die. Or shall I say, your ideas about yourself in connection with your career has to die. Another thing that has to die is your um, attachment uh, to your children, if you have them. This is very heavy, but it's true. If you have a strong attachment to your children, if you have them, that's really an attachment, like a glomming on, that has to die when you die, because they don't die with you, just for that simple reason. Your attachment to your children will be broken at death albeit there may be more to say about the communion of saints. But if you're overly or even keenly attached to your children, that dies at death. Um, another thing you have to lose um, uh, your attachment to is basically the entire world. All the signals that you get from the world, 
all the signals, all the cliches, what the world is in the New Testament sense, the world, in quotes, is simply the collective ego of humanity that is collectively defending itself against its own natural termination. So that the world is simply you, writ large, you and your ego, attempting to defend itself against um, death. So everything you read about, literally everything you read, if you actually believe it's true, it's basically a form of the collective ego in some form of denial. Think about this next time you're surfing the net or you're going on Google looking up something. And the things that you read, and what did we just find out this week? I, I thought this was fascinating. We just doctors say in the New England Journal of Medicine that it is now unhealthy to drink low-fat milk. That, that people who drink 1% or 2% low-fat milk are much more likely to die soon than people that drink whole milk. Now, blow me down. <laughs> you and I know that we will find out in about five years that diets that do not have gluten cause cancer. <laughs> now, why do I say it? I know nothing about gluten except I know what people feel about it. But I do know that everything I was ever taught about food in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, 10 years after I was told by the media the opposite was true, in every single case, I know of no exceptions that orthodoxies about food, 10 years after they were orthodoxies, were overturned by the New England Journal of Medicine, which, by the way, should be shut down. <laughs> now. The, um, I'm, I'm just trying to say, those are just little examples of, of, of anything that you are absorbing from the world uh, will, um, will, be, uh, will be nonsense. I have a series of sermons I want to preach on uh, cliches, uh, current cliches that are not true but appear to be true, and I want to preach a sermon on each one of these, and I'm not going to do it today. I want to preach a sermon on the expression, it's all good. Have you heard people say that? When everyone says something to you emphatically, oh, but it's all good, what does that mean? It's not all good. I hate it, but I'm trying to convince myself that it's all good. I, 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 right off the bat, the world is telling us to say it's all good, and it's a mammoth form of collective denial. Another one is, um, it is what it is. Have you ever heard anybody say it is what it is? That's, everybody who says that, the moment they're saying, they don't like that it is what it is. They want to be it is what it's not. Or it's not what it is. So these are every generation, you know, when Bill Clinton was being attacked for various activities, the great cliche was it, you're, you're, what, whatever you do in your private life shouldn't affect your professional life. Remember that? What, whatever you do privately doesn't have to affect your professional life. And I mean, I heard that. It was across the board. It's completely f f wrong. Anyone here who has problems in their professional life, it goes directly back to problems in your personal life. Of course, there are some problems at work that are circumstantial, but how you relate to them has everything to do with your psyche. All I'm trying to say is you can use your, oh, the biggest one, of course, was whatever. Whatever. <laughs> but Carmen, you have a, you, but, but Cartman, you, you have an alien observatory coming out of your rear end. Cartman says, whatever. Uh, well, um, what I want to say about that is um, all these, these statements that have a slight... Oh, another one is the devil's in the details. That's another one people say. It's completely not true. The devil is in the core. The devil's in me. The devil's in my primary motivations. It's in Paul. It's not in the details. But people say that as if it's somehow true. Um, a fellow told me the other day, well, it's in the Bible. Well, um, all I'm trying to say is, what, what, what have I tried to say? So, 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 so you have to give up your attachment to your career. I'm not trying to be the angel of death here. You may have a wonderful career, but the fact of death requires you, without exception, to give up the notion that career as such, in terms of your own going forward, has any real significance. Because when you die, it, it will be... Uh, people for, even forget... <laughs> 
well, honey, what did I do for 50 years? You were the chairman of General Motors. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Now, um, a career um, attachment to your children, let alone other people you love, um, I'm not going to say your wife or your significant other. That's different. That's something where you're in touch with eternity. But often with your children, you're only marginally in touch with, your, uh, uh, with that dimension because it's so much of extension of your own uh, ego self. So that's my first point. My first point is that when we die, we, um, we have to give up a th major values that we had been convinced were good. I mean, haven't you found this yourself? Anybody here gotten sick? And suddenly everything went up out of a cocked hat? Everything you were doing, I mean, uh, you, or you had an accident? Or you suddenly were told by the doctor that you have pancreatic cancer, you know? Um, just, it was like, uh, my whole life passed before me, and I, I couldn't even remember where I went to school. <laughs> Because the urgency of a sudden, engrossing, personal, physical, psychological situation put everything into perspective, and oh my gosh. Well, now, what is it that lasts? What is it that lasts? Well, um, here I, I want to um, uh, ask you to, this is part of your homework. D does anyone here uh, get pleasure out of making Spotify playlists? Well, a lot of the guys, it's generally a guy thing, but there are, I'm sure there are women who do too, but in my experience, Spotify is generally a male phenomenon. I mean, I, I can easily spend nine hours a day working on my Spotify playlist. <laughs> easily, because I'm always fine-tuning it. Or what about your iTunes playlists? I, I have seven iTunes playlists. Now, what I'm getting at here, if you want to know what's really going on with yourself, what kind of music, if you like music, what kind of music excites you at this point in your life? If you want to find out what's actually happening with you inside yourself, which you will never see, because rationally you'll deny it, ask yourself what kind of music is getting to you. I was someone the other day who absolutely adores Roy Orbison. Now, Roy Orbison had that beautiful high falsetto voice, you remember? A pretty woman, but he was at the Traveling Wilburys. He's a legendary figure. Uh, I, I regard him as truly a saint. Uh, and uh, Roy Orbison, um, I was talking to this person for whom Roy Orbison's love songs are highly poignant. They're highly poignant. And this person said to me, who loves Roy Orbison, said, you know, it's funny, he said, I, um, all of a sudden, I'm not interested in Roy Orbison. Now, what do you think is going on? Something has changed in the person so that the vibe of Roy Orbison, which is just an arbitrary name I've chosen out of the sky, doesn't touch them anymore. Something else does. I was talking to someone who is really brilliant, a young woman who is extremely smart on music. And she is the leading authority of anybody in my life on 80s new wave music. You know, like Aha, Fine Young Cannibals, Thompson Twins, Nick Kershaw... Um, anybody who grew up in the 80s knows this music, and it's her whole life. But she's about my age. And she said, this most amazing thing has happened. I'm completely not listening to new wave music. And I said, what are you listening to? And she sort of said, well, I can't tell you. And I said, well, what would you tell somebody else? <laughs> and she said, oh, the Grateful Dead and only the Grateful Dead. And I said, why do you think that is? Now, this person is a, is a former mega hippie. I and mean, this person was in the 60s or sorry, the 70s, was what you would call a bona fide hippie, an earth mother hippie, you know? Um, and uh, uh, that's just the way. And, and I said, why do you think that in your 50s, you've gone back solo to the Grateful Dead? And then I said, and what's your favorite song? Box of Rain! Uh, and what I found uh, in it, she said, I don't know. I think it puts me in touch with the person that I was when I was at my happiest. I thought, what a thing to say. I think it somehow this particular music puts me in touch with the person I was when I was happy. Now, of course, what does that say? It says that happiness might not have accompanied her all her life. But there was a period. Think about you. Now, let, let's, let's look at your, your Spotify playlist. 
go home as part of your homework and sit down and say to myself, what music do I really like right now in my life? I mean, obviously, it could be Mahler, you know? It could be Kamal Boutros, <laughs> you know? It could be, it could be uh, Miles Davis. It could be anything. But ask yourself, why am I drawn and attracted to this particular music, especially now that I'm not quite as attracted to Motorhead? You know what I mean? I mean, wh what, is, what, what is that about? Is it about the music? Nine. It's about you. So what you find when you look at, what, what you're looking at is you're looking at when you, the music that you love resonates with a chord. Uh, the Victorians called this the lost chord. It's a famous uh, anthem by uh, Arthur Seymour Sullivan, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan Sullivan. It was the most popular church and serious uh, anthem of all time in England in the Victorian era, and no one's here has ever heard it. It was called The Lost Chord, and it was about a musical chord that someone listens to, and as they listen to it, it seems to touch their archaeology, and all of a sudden, they're back there, and it was a good place. It was a happy place. <laughs> it was a place of delight. Let me give you an example. Um, anyone here know about the Tams? The Tams. Well, they were a beach music group in the 60s. The Tams, T-A-M-S. Well, if you were in that period, beach music connoted to you, fun girls, uh, sand, beach, you know, all those sorts of beach boy type of things. But this is a Southern Carolina variant. And they have a song, anyone who lived through that period, they did a song called Be Young, Be Foolish, Be Happy. Look it up. Be young, be foolish, be happy. And anyone who's lived through that era, when you hear be young, be foolish, be happy, you melt. Because you were young, you were foolish, and you were a little happy. Now you're no longer young, you, you can't afford to be foolish, and you're definitely not happy. You're in a relationship that's going nowhere fast. You're not in a relationship at all, and your loneliness is so oppressive. You just, you, what is it? Um, that song by B.J. Thomas, I'm so lonesome I could cry. You're, you're so lonesome you could cry, or you're in a hell of a relationship that is deeply, powerfully damaging, and in every sense not getting you love, uh, or your whatever. But, um, so think about your Spotify playlist. Now, let me say that that is the closest link that I can give you experientially to the person that you're going to be when you die. The person that you die after death is the person who is touched now by a Spotify playlist that gets you emotional when you're driving in your car or sleeping in your bed at night alone, thinking. I often, I've preached a sermon, uh, what, how will St. Peter at the pearly gates judge your Spotify playlist? And to quote St. Francis, if you're truthful about it, if you give him your Spotify playlist as it really is, not what you think it ought to be, you all go to heaven. So that's the first thing, I'll, that's the second point. The Spotify playlist, now the, the, this is a clue though to even something else. You've heard this, it's almost a cliche, but... The closest you ever were to eternal life is when you were in love. I, I want to put that out as a maxim, as an aphorism. The closest you've ever been to eternal life is when you were in romantic love. Now, that can happen at any stage of life. It can happen in any uh, era um, and it is a very powerful thing. But if you are in touch, and that's where the Spotify playlist is your, that's your marker, you know, that's your flare. You know when the bombers, they always have to have flares in World War II so they could find the target of the bomb? The Spotify playlist, your music, is the marker which will take you to the place where you were in some form or another loved, in love, or both. And when you get to that point in your own thought. You know you are home. Pope Francis preached a very interesting sermon about this. <clears throat> Sometimes I get a little bit, a bit bashful that I get quite so nostalgic about music. And a week and a half ago, it was only three days after he left Philadelphia, 
He preached in the Casa San Marta. You know, he preaches twice a week in his uh, private chapel, Pope Francis does. I don't know how he does it. I mean, I don't know how he does these brilliant sermons. Uh, you know, you almost think he must have a speechwriter, but apparently he doesn't. Um, he preached a sermon on nostalgia based on the text in Nehemiah when the children of Israel got back to Jerusalem and they immediately felt at home. And he said, this is a direct quote from Saint, uh, Pope Francis, Nostalgia is the best thing you have going because nostalgia is inevitably for something that was good, right, and loving. You don't have nostalgia for your period in Alcatraz. You don't. You have nostalgia for when things were good and love was in the air. And he said, Pope Francis said, if you don't have nostalgia, you can never have joy. Give me a break. Pope Francis said this thing? I mean, he just went right through me. I mean, right, he drilled right through me. If you don't, he, he blessed my nostalgia. He said, your nostalgia takes you back to joy. And joy, when, you, when you're really in the place of joy, you're home. And he also said, that's your true identity. Your true identity is that where, from, to which you have nostalgia in the present. And by the way, that could be nostalgia for just a few years ago. We hate, Mary and I, to go to Amagansett, Long Island. Now, uh, Amagansett is a, is a suburb of uh, the great large city of uh, East Hampton, which is a suburb of New Rochelle, New York. And we, um, we now, why do we detest going to Amagansett, Long Island? Because Mary and I raised three little tiny babies in our summers when we served an Episcopal church, which is going out of existence as an Episcopal parish. Um, we, George Bailey, we, um, we, go, we go back to Amagansett, and what do we think about when we drive around busy, rich, hyper, overpopulated, once beautiful Amagansett? What do we think about? We think about our children when they were little. We think about the happiness that we had, little children at the beach. I don't give a hoot about East Hampton and about all this new growth and development. Montauk, you know, I, are you out of your mind? All I care about is the fact that we had little children, and Mary had a medical emergency once there, a serious one, and when we go there, we, we're, it, we become nostalgic for something that we've lost. But of course, it's also pleasure in that. Um, I'm just trying to say that your nostalgia takes you to where your hope is, and that is in love. If you want to understand what goes on after the grave, remember, um, St. Paul said this, faith, hope, and love abide. But the greatest of these is love. And I'm just telling you that the Spotify playlist is your plumb line to where you knew love or where you might know it now. And that's what you'll carry with you. <clears throat> that is the sure empirical indication of what you, um, what you, uh, what you will carry uh, beyond the grave. Now, I'm going to say one other thing, and then uh, we're done. Uh, then we can open it up a little bit, maybe. What I have said is, first, that it is an empirically verifiable observation that men and women in 99.9 .9 per cases, based on observation, have got to lose the idea that their career as such is important or significant. And that is a shocking realization, especially uh, not so much to me because I saw my career go down the tubes. And you, but you may have not seen it happen yet. Hopefully, your career hasn't gone down the tubes. But I'll bet you there's some people here whose career has gone down the tubes. Maybe they had to change, you know, reinvent themselves, you know, or do something like that. But if you've ever seen it, you'll see immediately, and hopefully you won't have to get for your dying moment to realize it, when the, 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 the shades of the prison house really close in. That's a quotation from uh, Wordsworth. Um, but you will find that a career and strong attachments to other people accept romantic att attachments. Because one of the things you'll find is that when you're dying, there is one person whom you wish was there. Not two. This, this, here's another thing that people say. Oh, we, 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 we die in community. Have you ever heard that? We die in community? It's completely not true. 
No one who's ever died would say that they were dying in a community. It's nice to have all my friends from Calvary St. George's around me when I'm dying. But all I really want is one person. Now, of course, that may vary. You know, your one person is your one person. And it could be, in fact, a child. Or it could be a sister. Generally speaking, though, it won't be. Generally speaking, it'll be someone whom you loved as a peer in a romantic relationship. Generally speaking, again, there are always exceptions, but generally speaking, I want Mona. But you've, you, you've been divorced from Mona for 30 years. I want Mona. Are you kidding? She lives in California. She's been married twice. I want Mona. And Mona, you call Mona, you know, this is Bill's son, 47 years old. I don't even know who you are, Mrs. So-and-so, but my, my father keeps calling for you. What did you say his name was? Because <laughs> yeah, yeah. Mona doesn't relate to you the way you relate to Mona. So, but, 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 but believe me, this is where you're close. This is where you know what you're going to carry. Whatever it is, faith, hope, ab love, abide. But the greatest of these is love. And Paul talks about that specifically as the one thing that is unmediated as opposed to faith and hope. Love is the one unmediated good that we have in this life that doesn't change character at the moment of death. And that's really something to think about. Now, the final thing. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. This is. Shall I go on for five more minutes? Yeah. Okay. Well, hey. Oh, hey. Um, uh, if you like the Eric Burden and the Animals, the great group from the '60s, one of the greatest moments of all rock and roll is when Eric Burden, who is like 19 years old, is giving a concert for the New Music Express in London. And he uh, comes on with the Alan uh, Price and all the great animals. In he's only 19. And right in the middle of his song, Boom, Boom, he takes his coat off and he throws it into the air. Now, of course, today that's nothing, right? But in 1962, in England, for him to throw his coat in the air? Anyway, um, <laughs> it, I, I, I knew, I've, I've seen him. I've been with him twice in my life. And the only person I ever wanted to be like was Eric Burden. I mean, Billy Graham was fine, but Eric Burden just shoots him out of the water. Now, um, but you know, you have one too. If, if I tell you who would you like to be like, you'll lie. Oh, I want to be like Mother Elizabeth Seton. You know, in fact, what you really want to be like is uh, 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 Michael Jackson. <laughs> now, um, there's one other thing, though, that's really important. And this is that um, what the Christian... Um, uh, core of, uh, of, of life has one other little aspect which has to be underlined. You can go to your death not having made peace with your career, not having made peace with your family, or your natural family or your extended family, not having made peace with your journey, and you can still be completely forgiven for the fact that you were basically an adolescent, even though you were 70. Don't you have fathers? I mean, don't, you, don't you know about fathers? They're all 17. They, they, they appear to be 75, but they're really just 13 years old. The, the wives are often much more together. But the, the men are just a joke. But anyway, I mean, I'm speaking for myself. But what, what, what do we need, in addition to all that I've told you, there's one absolutely crucial thing that we must have, and that is we need to be, to die, being forgiven for the person that we actually are. Now, Jim here has a phrase that became sort of the kind of rubric or signature of, uh, of uh, his cathedral up in Springfield, and the word was, as is. Jim would always say, God loves you, as is. Now, that's not something that a non-Christian can actually say. So you see, the gospel says that even if I don't understand myself at all, even if I am still enormously confused about the different forms that my life took, God uh, does forgive. I watched Pope Francis a lot. I was very interested to watch how he dealt two weeks ago today with the prisoners at Philadelphia. Remember, he visited uh, high-intensity prisoners. And as he looked at them, 
And I, because every single encounter was filmed. You can see it on Conference of Catholic Bishops website. That's a real fun website normally. But, <laughs> but, but this particular one was good. And he looked at these men and women. There were women who were murderers and uh, just like the men that were there. And he looked at them as if they had never done anything wrong in their lives. He, and, and I kept wanting to say, I wish I could be accused of a, was in prison for a terrible crime and could sit there right now. Because he looked at them with a look that was understanding. What is understanding? Understanding means they understand why you lived the way you did. And who understands you? And who really understands the decisions that you've made? Because some of them have been terrible, have been profoundly selfish, appallingly un just out of it, ridiculous decisions that you've made, especially in relationships. But Saint France, Pope Francis looks at you, those people, and he said, I understand why you're carrying the particular burden you're carrying. And secondly, he was saying, and I sympathize with you. He started by saying, I come to you as a brother among brothers and sisters. And he wasn't kidding. That was what was so striking. Because he put his touch, he handled these people. He, he had absolutely no problem with putting his lips up against somebody's cheek that might have all sorts of, who knows what he might be encountering. And um, so he understood, he, he was sympathetic with these men and women. And finally, there was a look of forgiveness about him. And, um, you know, you have some things that need to be forgiven too. They're not um, necessarily felonies, although probably several of you are felons. Um, <laughs> But uh, there, there are, <laughs> two people laugh very uncomfortably. Um, but, um, but having said that, he, he, what do you want? You want to die. You want someone to look at you and said, you know, you made so many mistakes. I, I just, the, all the books in the world couldn't do justice to the mistakes you made. Nevertheless, I forgive you. And that is the utter heart of the final word about when we're dying, that um, people have to know that they are, uh, that they can handle, that God can handle anything. And P.S., this is why Christians need to be against physician-assisted suicide. I, I don't want to say Christians need to be against this or that, but there's one no-brainer. Christians, by definition, are not in favor of physician-assisted suicide because it, it cuts off the, the person who's depressed and does that. I understand why, and I'm sympathetic, and they can be forgiven. But if we say we want people to do that or encourage people to do it, we're not giving them the ability to, to really uh, hear the word of God that, they, that, that, that they're as is. You know, it's not worth killing yourself because God accepts you as is. And see the movie The Sentinel. It came out in 1976, and it's about the entrance to hell in a third-story brownstone in Brooklyn Heights on Montague Terrace. And Mrs. Smith, Melina Smith, I said, please go see 19 Montague Terrace. And she said, I've already been. Uh, that is a story about a woman whose life is so troubled that she commits, attempts to commit suicide two times. And she's saved, and God appoints for her a powerful ministry to try to discourage others from doing it. Anyway, that's a throwaway. Thank you for listening. And uh, we've got maybe 10 minutes uh, for uh, questions or comments. Yes. Sorry? I can't tell you. It's very personal. <laughs> but I'll give you a hint. B.J. Thomas's song, Hooked on a Feeling. <laughs> Those of you who know what? B.J. Thomas, Hooked on a Feeling? Jim? <laughs> a lot of it has to do with your age. See, because you're, if you're 45 or you're 25, your Spotify playlist will be completely different because the Spotify playlist will consist of songs that hit you at a moment in your life when love was present and joy was present. But because you didn't live in 1968 and you lived in 1988, it'll be Nick Kershaw, you know what I'm saying, or uh, John Waite, you know, Men at Work. 
Um, but, uh, um, but, but, but everyone has their own. Yes. Well, I want to say something about that. <laughs> I heard the same program, and suicide is a very uh, hot topic right now, and I'll bet you many people here have considered it at some point or another. I don't know anybody who hasn't considered it abstractly. They did do a survey, apparently, of the people who've thrown themselves off the Golden Gate Bridge, which is a popular destination <laughs> for suicide. Um, apparently, like 10 have survived. Not just one, ten, for all sorts of strange and odd reasons. And um, they've interviewed every one, and every single one said the following thing. At the moment of actually throwing myself off the bridge, I thought to myself, I wish I hadn't done this. <laughs> Without exception, when they actually came to the point, they said, I wish I hadn't done this. Isn't that interesting? Anyway. Uh, yes. Well, obviously, um, uh, if I've thought about it, um, and I have. Not seriously recently, you always have to say that, but actually that's not true. Yeah, I mean, not, not recently, but there have been points in my life when I wondered whether it might be a better thing to end it rather than to stay on. I've had the thought, just make it painless. You know, I think it's apple juice or applesauce and something else. But um, what I, um, I want to say is people who get to that degree of pain are people who haven't been listened to. They almost all haven't been listened to no, no, pain of any kind. Oh, well, I'm talking about mental pain. Oh, well, physical pain. Well, that's a whole other issue, you know. I hear you. Uh, physical pain can be often far more controlled than people want to realize. We do know this, right? Uh, if I spent a lot of time in hospices. I don't want to get off on that subject, but it is true that a great many uh, extremely painful final moments uh, uh, can, in fact, be less painful than they appear. Um, so that's a good, good point. Uh, Mary, do you want to add anything to that about pain? About pain and uh, pain and uh, when you're so painful you want to kill yourself, when you're so in pain. Stand up. What? Wait, what are you saying? Yes, I would say that most of the people I know, and I was talking to somebody the other day who's going to Switzerland, I think in 10 days. <laughs> she's going to, is it Zurich? You know, the clinic where you can go. She's got her ticket and she's going. And I said, I don't understand. Uh, she's, this is a person I know, just like anybody here. I said, I just, why are you doing this? And she said, I just don't want to go on. I mean, she is sick, but she actually knows that she could get all kinds of medication to help her. She's, what she really is is she's profoundly depressed. Now, I'm not trying to reduce it to that, but most of you, just, let's talk about you and not about somebody else. If you've ever thought that death would be preferable to the life you're living, it usually is an emotional state to some extent, isn't it? You know, I mean, you say to yourself, I'd rather be anywhere than here. I can't stand this pain of rejection. This rejection is so great that I would rather die than live one more hour with this degree of rejection. So that's, uh, I think, uh, a huge factor in people who get to that point. Maybe two more questions or thoughts? Yes, sir. About romantic love? Yes. Well, um, listen to my podcasts. 
I, this is a frequent theme. I do a podcast on iTunes, and I'm not trying to blow you off at all because I'll mention I do a lot of podcasts called PZ's Podcast, and it's on iTunes, and it's free, and it's uh, downloadable for free. And um, I had to tell my mother that. Um, and uh, um, the thing about romantic love, it, why do I say that? It's because the most painful moments that many people actually have are connected with romantic love that has gone bad. It's just a fact. Often people will say, the worst time of my entire life was when my husband left me for my best friend. Think of the rejection involved. The worst time I ever had in my entire life was when my second girlfriend dumped me. And then on the next day on the college campus, I saw her walking with somebody else. And I realized, fill in the blanks, and I wanted to die. I've also had people say, on the other hand, have you seen South Pacific? I'm as corny as Kansas in August, high as a kite on the 4th of July. I'm in love, I'm in love, I'm in love, I'm in love, I'm in love with a wonderful guy. That's called a peak experience. And if you've had those kinds of experiences, when you really were in, felt loved and actually loved without any degree of constraint, you know, when it was totally a free response and it was a totally free gift, that is the closest thing that most people ever come to eternal life. Because it's, I mean, he said it. He said, now we see in 1 Corinthians 13, we, we see th through a glass darkly our life. But, but when the perfect comes, which is love, we won't need these other things. Hope ends after you die. Because there's, no, it's, there's nothing more to hope for because whatever's hoped for has happened, right? And you don't need faith in the eternal life, do you? Because faith is the evidence of things unseen, right? But when you see it, and I associate this with the love of Christ, which I saw in the face of Pope Francis, when you see it, um, you know that that will go on afterwards. I, uh, you know, I've often felt that, you know, what do I, when I'm dying, what am I really going to want? I'm going to want Mary holding my hand. I mean, it sounds so dumb, right? I mean, what a dumb thing to say. I mean, not dumb to me, but I mean, it could sound lame. But what do I really want? I want the person I love uh, holding my hand. And that will, in its, what, in, do you know about how Henry VIII died? Henry VIII, Henry the blanking eighth. Henry VIII was dying, and his, he, he, there were no women left, right? <laughs> he, 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 he was so, I mean, talk about prostate cancer, you know. Uh, and he, um, he, he, you know what he wanted? He wanted Thomas Cranmer, who was the Protestant archbishop, who, by the way, for his pains, was burned to death <laughs> a few years later. Uh, but he wanted, he said, I want Thomas Cranmer. And, he, and Thomas Cranmer came, who was a rather professorial-looking type, a little like Pope Francis. He was sort of a disappointment, you know, face-wise. And he took Cranmer's hand, and Cranmer said something to the effect of, Your Majesty, do you believe that you're going to heaven and that you're inheriting the promises of God in Christ? Something like that. And he, he held Cranmer's hand in a vice-like grip, and then he died. Now, that's what we're talking about. And I bless Cranmer. That's true, by the way. Um, Jacob, is it time to finish? I thought, John Zoll, do you have anything you want to say? No, I just love hearing you talk. I think there's a lot of really interesting insights for us. Uh, but I think other people are aware of that, too. And Thank you. Thank you. And you know, because I, I value my son's opinion, I just want to say that I'm wrong in assisted suicide. <laughs> that was a joke. Okay. Um, uh, but bless you all. That's a, that's a powerful point. Uh, come back next week. And your homework is to write out your Spotify playlist in light of 1 Corinthians 13. And we're going to talk about, we're going to go through 1 Corinthians 13 in terms of where we're going vis-a-vis -vis love. Thank you so much.